What I want to do, uh, this came to me a week or so ago, and we'll, we'll study it here. It may transfer over onto Sunday mornings as well. It occurred to me that of all the subjects <clears throat> that we're not hearing any longer from America's pulpits, and there's quite a few of them, essential doctrines, I think that we could consider this, in, in a sense, an essential doctrine as well. Um, I think it'd be self-evident why. But when we uh, when we think about what the Bible says, in fact, let's let's go there. It'd be easier to explain what I'm trying to say than to just to say. Let's go over to Ephesians chapter six. Ephesians chapter 6 at verse 10 where the Apostle Paul says finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what we really want to look at, but we should go further and read the rest. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. Verse 11 says, put the armor on. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. All right, let's stop there. So let's champion the obvious. What, what, do, we, what do we have pictured here? Humor me. Yeah, this is someone going to war. And when the gospel is not presented in the totality of the truth, you have problems. One of the first problems, and I have told you many times how I experienced this. When you're listening to, at least back years ago when I was listening to, the radio and messages on faith and uh, whatever wasn't just a, a, a deliberate exaggeration of uh, the, the doctrine of biblical faith there was always a tendency to even if it wasn't said it was at least in my mind understood that if you have faith things go right I mean everything goes right that's the way I thought of it. That's the way I thought that some of these preachers were uh, bringing it across. And it's something, again, that this is what we want to hear. You have faith in God. We know it can move mountains, miracles, miracles of healing. Faith is a requirement for answer to prayer and on and on. 
But that's not all that the Bible says about faith. You know, at the end of uh, the Apostle Paul's life in 2 Timothy, he states that I have fought a good fight. I've kept the faith. So when we talk about faith in Christ and, and the, um, let's say, the benefits, Psalm 103, forget not all his benefits. When we talk about the uh, benefits of Christ, answer to, answers to prayer and healing for our bodies and strength when we need it and on and on, all these great promises. We have to remember that those promises are given to us in the midst of a very real war. One of the problems with looking at a text like this is, this, is to unintentionally uh, allegorize it as a kind of a, a um, how do I say this, uh, to allegorize this as a kind of a theoretical war. But if you're walking with the Lord and you're pressing in and you're truly uh, desiring to, to know Christ more and more and so forth, and God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, you're experiencing real warfare. Someone, and that's who we're going to study, someone who's out to do his very best to prevent you from going forward. Initially, he prevents you or tries to prevent you from accepting Christ. Once you've accepted Christ and you're truly saved, you're born again, then all throughout our life is always there at every step, uh, relatively speaking, every step, to thwart us go, to go forward, whether it's in our personal life or to bring others to Christ and to speak to them about the Word of God and so on. So in Ephesians chapter 6, armor is mentioned. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand. Right? So you need the armor to be able to conquer, to be able to remain standing and not get knocked down and or killed against the wiles of the devil. Now, the word wiles means a strategy. So, again, we, we, all, uh, we all understand that when men go to war, nations go to war, that they have strategy. They learn the position of the enemy, the strength of the enemy. They learn the, uh, even the philosophy of the enemy. And you, you have to know your enemy. And then they make plans. Each battle has a plan. The overall war, at, at least at some point in wars, will have a plan. How to finish this, how to complete it, and how to win it. I think uh, it, 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 is, it just occurred to me, I mean, not again that any of us don't know this, but it just occurred to me and became very, very clear that we are in a war. We are in a war for for our lives and not just the temporary benefits of you know what inheritance we'll leave to our children or to our grandchildren or for that matter for ourselves we're in a war for where we're going to spend eternity we're in a war for our children and grandchildren and and friends and and the country and on, on the world we're in a battle and I think it's unfortunate, number one, that this subject is not taught uh, enough. Number two, that we don't really understand the enemy. We don't know much about him. And that's what led me to this conclusion that it's been a while since we've really studied the nature, the character, and the strategies of Satan. You've heard me say it, sometimes speaking in a light moment, but in 42 years now of ministry, I can guarantee you that Satan goes to church. All right, we talk about the church as a people, but the expression we use, Satan definitely shows up 
when the church is assembled. We see this in the lives of the apostles. As I mentioned to you on Sunday, when Jesus said and talked about going to the cross, that he was going to die on a Roman cross, and of course the apostles still don't comprehend who he really is as far as his mission, the Lamb of God, behold the Lamb of God. He's talking about his life as a, as a sacrifice to atone for our sins, which would have kept us out of hell, uh, kept us out of heaven rather, and, and put us in hell. So when um, we look at Jesus and he says that he's going to the cross and so on, Peter says, may it never be. No. And Jesus said, as we, I told you Sunday, get thee behind me, Satan. That's not, at least in my opinion, that's not just a metaphoric use of Satan's name. Satan was influencing his thinking, Peter's thinking. And perhaps in the mind of Satan, I wouldn't know, perhaps in the mind of Satan, because remember, Satan doesn't have the, the um, nature, quality, character, and abilities of God. For instance, God is all-knowing. Satan is not all-knowing. But certainly he knows quite a lot. So maybe perhaps it was a satanic attempt I mean, a sincere satanic attempt to go through Peter to get to Jesus, to talk him out of the cross. I can't say for certain that that was the case, but nothing else in my mind seems to make sense that Satan would put this thought into Peter's mind. Because evidently, at least at some point in time, Satan started to understand what the death on the cross, what Christ's death on the cross would mean, would mean that people like you and me, he'd never own them again. That we were gonna be bought off the slave market and now we would become saved, purchased by the blood. And that we would be able to see God whom he knows, that much he knows, he will never see again. Even though we're gonna look through Job, there's some mysteries here that I'm not sure that anybody has completely resolved. But, uh, especially when we're in the Old Testament. However, Satan knows a few things. Number one, hell was created for him and the angels that followed him. Being the vindictive individual that he is, he has every intention of taking as many human beings, remember we're created in the image of God whom he hates. He has every intention of taking that creature, human beings, who were created by God to be in many respects, or some respects, to be in God's image, created in God's image. He has every intention of taking whomever he will with him. Remember when the Apostle Peter said, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary the devil walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. And that's exactly what we're going to see when we go to Job. Because God is going to ask Satan, he says, where have you been? And again, that's Rhetorical question. God knows where he's been. But Satan will say, I've been walking to and fro throughout the earth. And that's when God will brag on Job. Has thou considered my servant Job? So, we're in a battle. And it's a very, very real battle. And what, what prompted this uh, in my mind is the fact that as we're watching the world reading and hearing the news. As I was listening and have been listening and, and, ha and am listening to people speak, there's two things that I see from human point of view. Number one, we are, we're heading down the chute to the last days, 
to the Great Tribulation, to the formation of a one world government and a uh, one world religion, a false prophet who will feed the Antichrist and the Antichrist who will be the world's uh, greatest dictator to a period of time that Jesus spoke about that would never be equaled before it, 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 that, that time and never will be equaled again. That's how bad it's going to be. That's number one. I'm convinced of that. Number two, the things that people are saying now, so many people are saying now, are un, unreasonable. Meaning that people are starting to lose their ability to reason correctly. Remember I've told you that in law, we know mostly we always hear the first part of the, the legal statement. That in the criminal law, the prosecutor must present the case against the defendant or defendants, plural, beyond reasonable doubt. Reasonable. If the prosecutor can present enough evidence that's reasonable for a jury of 12 people, men and women, to say, well, this, it's, prob it's probable or the evidence is conclusive that this person committed this crime, then the, the verdict is guilty, then there's a sentence. But we only remember, or maybe we've only heard the first half of that statement in criminal law. In criminal law, it's the prosecutor must present his or her case beyond reasonable doubt to a reasonable mind. Now we watched this Jussie Smollett yesterday uh, get off on 16 counts of fraud and uh, whatever all these charges were, they weren't good. And uh, you know, we'll see how this is gonna play out, but you know, it's, it's it's, it's an example of the type of evil that's creeping more and more onto the earth. These are evil days. Behind it all is a spirit, but not just a force. It's a spirit being, a very real being. Now, now listen to me. The reason that we have to take Satan seriously is because Jesus does. A prime um, example, when you're looking at Jesus' ministry of the miraculous, that is in, uh, in his ministry frequently is the casting out of devils, out of people. We see many, many people possessed with devils that he cured. Sometimes they were called in the King James Bible, a lunatic uh, the man who, uh, Legion, Roman Legion had 6,000 soldiers. Demons aren't like, you know, mass and matter where they can only occupy so much space. And well, maybe we'll get into some of this and I'll give you my ideas on how I think that it, it may work. When we talk about someone being demon possessed. But I'll give you one thought right now. The actual word in Greek, daimonize, means to be demonized. And may not, it may not be so much as thinking of, you know, someone being totally possessed, as we see in the extreme examples, like Legion in the Bible. But the idea that he's able to influence our thinking. And remember when we talked some time, quite some time ago about the importance of biblical doctrine. Doctrine is what you believe about the Bible. That's what you believe the Bible says. And that belief conducts your behavior. I mean, if you truly believe the things that you've read and heard, um, at least from this pulpit, then it affects your behavior. For instance, for example, if you really thought that 
to be born again and Christ paid the debt of all your sins, but you can still keep doing the things that you were doing, or even worse, is that you can do even more sinful things because now that you're, you're saved. That's a satanic strategy, and it's in direct opposition to what this Bible says. The Bible says just the opposite. Now, we've been talking about repentance. And repentance, as we know, means to turn, fully turn to God. And it means to renounce adultery, stealing, lying, blaspheming God, uh, breaking the, the Lord's day. This is one of the Ten Commandments. Remember that. It means we turn from these things. And then, like I said Sunday, these branches, the main branches, let's say there's ten of them, Ten Commandments, then they have many mother, other branches, and then there's leaves, and there's all types of variations, small and large, of God's laws. <clears throat> but it's Satan, in addition to our sinful hearts and our sinful imagination, but it's Satan who's the one who introduces the lie. God said, let's go, we don't have to go there, turn there, but just, let's just review it in our heads. In the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and his wife, you could eat of every single tree except one. You cannot eat that. And the day that you eat it, you will die. All right? They never touched it. Until Satan comes along, but in, in, in the early, well, the first time we meet Satan, he's called the serpent. Interesting in one of the last times we meet Satan, he's also called the serpent or the dragon in the book of the Revelation. So he comes along and he says to Eve, the woman, hath God said. Now we start with this. We start with the fact that Satan is in, Satan's nature is to contradict what God said. So he starts off by asking Eve, has God said, and he kind of, you know, there's a direct lie where you're going to recognize it right away that it's a lie. Then there's a way to put it across where the lie is the way, you know, sometimes you have to give your dog medicine, but they won't take it, so you wrap it up in a piece of uh, meat or a, a ham or something, and they, they, just, they take both the food and the medicine at the same time. Well, Satan does that a lot with, with us. Now, for some, he doesn't have to do it, but just say, do what you want. Do as you please. Because some people, well, many people don't know Christ, so they don't know any, anything that Christ has said and so forth. Or their conscience is so blunted that they no longer know right and wrong. But for the Christian, the conscience comes alive, and God says, do this and don't do that. And Satan comes along and he says, has God said that you're supposed to do this? Now, we were here several months back when we were going through Matthew 25, 30. The unprofitable servant, it wasn't what he had done, it was what he had not done. And we gotta remember something here too about sin. Because we're going to be talking about Satan, how he accents these things. We have to remember that sin is not only what we do when God says, don't do this. But sin is what we do not do when God says, do this. I'm commanding you to do this. So sin has, is one coin, but two sides. Do this, and we don't do it. Don't do this, and we do it. Okay, so we have the sins of commission. God says, don't commit adultery. We commit adultery. God says, serve me. Use your gifts and talents and develop them and build in the kingdom. And to me, you know what's uh, frightening? And you could ask any pastor, I know in the United States, but I think that it's probably across the board around the world. How many of the people that come out to uh, services, church services, 
are actually using their gifts and talents to build the kingdom. And just knowing Americans and having pastored Americans, it's certainly not the majority. And to me, that's a frightful thought. Because assuming that they're not committing adultery, stealing, lying, and coveting, and so on, they're missing something else. As God said, well, yeah, but it's not just that. It's do this, and they're not doing it. That's, um, that's a serious question. It's a serious thing to start thinking that God said, do this, and you're not doing it. Both are sin, and both are enough to, to destroy you. All right. So who is the one that whispers in our ears? Let's, let me go back onto this as an example, because I think it's a good one. Certainly an important one. Has God said to you that you should be using your gifts and talents to build the kingdom? And if you don't, you'll end up like the unprofitable servant in Matthew 25, particularly verse 30. And you say, well, um, yeah, he has told me to use my gifts and talents, but I've been busy, blah, blah, blah. And then Satan says this, you're not going to die. You're going to heaven. He's going to still be pleased with you. This is what we're, we're seeing sold on the marketplace of Christianity. It's being told to people by preachers, whether, whether tacitly or explicitly, it's all about you. I'm here to tell you today it's all about you. And my job is to make sure that you are happy. And I remember a conversation that I had years ago with a man who had just moved, that young man, had just moved out of um, the apartment that he and his wife had. They were only married a couple of years. And as we were talking, he mentioned to me that he was not happy. She was not happy. And that's when I said to him, something I've said to you, that it's called holy matrimony. Not necessarily happy matrimony. That's why we take vows. It's not always happy. We're human beings. So we, we keep to the vow because we took that vow not to a minister, not to a church denomination, to a board of elders or a group of bishops. We took that vow before God. And God expects us to keep our word. So Satan comes and whispers in your ear, anything that's in the 31,102 verses in this Bible, Satan will contradict it. And tell you that you're not going to die. And so we see him in... In Genesis chapter 3, we first meet Satan. And the first thing that he does is he contradicts the word of God. And so he convinces Eve that his argument that they will not die is better than God's command that they will die. And then we read in the 50th chapter of uh, Genesis at the very last verse, Concerning the patriarch Joseph where it says and they buried Joseph in a coffin in Egypt And people have been dying physically and then spiritually ever since All right, so what I want to do is To start I just want to look at the verses Where Satan the name Satan is used so turn with me to first Chronicles and we're going to see another one of those subtleties. And when we, uh, though we haven't read it or looked at it, when we do read Genesis 3, we see that one of the characteristics of Satan is that he's subtle. The best way to convince people of a lie is just, you know, for instance, let's look at some of our congressmen and women, or for that matter, anybody that's in, in authority over us, and imagine if a congressman or a congresswoman stood up tomorrow in session and said, look, it, let me be honest with you. I'm here to ruin America. Okay, that's not going to go over well with anybody. So Satan does the same thing. He doesn't come into your life and say, I'm here to make sure you don't make the kingdom. I'm here to... Uh, to to seduce you to violate God and believe you're still in good standing with him and believe that you're going to heaven 
when he knows, and certainly God knows, that they're not. That's what he does. So we read in Genesis 3 that he is very subtle. And the further we go, you know, all of us here, the further that we go in our relationship with the Lord, the more subtle sin becomes. The more we're not, we just don't catch it. We don't see it. So we go back to Peter and he says, be sober. Sobriety, again, it's a metaphor, one we can understand between, um, I'm sure that you've spoken to a drunk before. And uh, we used to have outdoor meetings, a year, I say we, there was a church that had outdoor meetings up in Port Chester, New York years ago. And every year, you know, I would be one of the people who was also there helping the church out with my youth group and I would sing and share my testimony or whatever I did. And they had, he had other guest speakers. It lasted for like a week. And I remember, one, I remember one night a drunk came and he was you know, pretty, pretty plastered. And he was talking to me and he was talking to the guest speaker. And after he left, the uh, speaker, the, the guest speaker, the pastor said to me, he says, you know, never, try to, to speak to a drunk. And um, I think there is some, you know, uh, that that's not a final statement, but when it comes to Christ, because Christ can sober you up real quick, but there is some wisdom to that, because they forget the, the night, the next day, what, uh, what conversation took place about their need for Christ and what have you. But, I mean, you get the idea. Satan doesn't come in and say, I'm here to bring you away from Christ. And then I'm also here to make you think you're still going to heaven, and etc. Very subtle. And when we first see the name Satan used is in 1 Chronicles chapter 21. And, uh, not surprisingly... It's a subtlety that Satan brings against David that gets David in trouble with God. Look at verse 1 in chapter 21 of 1 Chronicles. And Satan stood up against Israel. Now that's a whole nation. This is not just one-on-one, -on -one, which Satan certainly can do. And remember, we haven't, we're not going to deal tonight with all of his minions, all of his angels, demons. Here it says Satan stood up against the whole nation of Israel and provoked David to number Israel. All right, let's stop there. So what's the big deal? It's just a census. That's all. Now remember, up to this point, David always lived by faith. We all love to hear the story. I love to preach it. When David stands up against the, uh, Goliath. And David says to Goliath, you come to me with a sword and a shield and a spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. It's a nine-foot giant. He's a little boy. This uh, Goliath was a warrior from a child like the Spartans, and David is a shepherd. He's got five stones. The, the other guy is Goliath, is in armor and all of this, and David wins. With his sling and a stone. Five stones, actually, but he only, only took the first one. Whew. And why? Well, of course he was, he was proficient with a, with a sling and a stone. But he trusted the Lord. But as we look, look at David going along. He has his moments just like we do. His sin with Bathsheba. Um, a few other areas, and this is one of them. So what was it about numbering Israel... It's going to bring a great wrath of God uh, upon the nation from the decision of the king, who, as we know, is a godly king. Well, when you start to, you know, let me say it this way. Here's an example. It's like tithing. Now, I don't care what church you go to, again, like getting people to work in ministry, working in their gifts and talents, I mean. And they think, you know, some, some people think, if they sign on for a ministry, they're doing the pastor a favor. They're doing me no favors at all. None at all. That's your obligation to work in your gift and talent with the Lord. 
But let's do it this way. When it comes to tithing. And so the preacher's quoting the book talking about financial giving. And so you're going home and the math, it just doesn't add up. <laughs> well, if I give a tithe, then, and then you have bills and, and what have you. And you know, I used to think if I could get Christians to pray, that you know, then you'd pretty much everything would follow. But I, uh, I changed my mind about that a long, long time ago. I have come to the conclusion if you can get Christians to use their gifts and talents and actually work in the ministry and give financially, even though sometimes the math doesn't add up. I think for a lot of us, the math does, doesn't add up. We're counting our dollars, tithe, and then there's a second offering, at least in this church, there's a second offering, tithes and offerings. I mean, what does he expect? And I want to remind you that I don't expect anything. I have never pastored in all these years trusting the people. It's not that I don't like you. I just don't trust you. I don't. I've lived long enough to watch some of the people who were closest to me in a moment. Just turn their back on me. Just walk the other way. Are they thinking of me, my family? No. So if you're, you know, you want to go in the ministry... If God has called you to the ministry, and this is what we need, by the way, we have to have men who are going to totally trust God because the arm of the flesh is going to fail you in some way, maybe a small way. And if you're in my shoes and many other pastors, it's going to be in big ways, but God will never fail you. But you've got to pass the test. Oh, you say, people say, I can't tithe. I, I wish I could. But they never get the principle. It's not, God, give me the money so I can tithe. God says, you give me the money. And I will provide for your every single need. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Every single need. Mm. It's a subtlety. Well, that's what we're, we're dealing with here with David. David was not supposed to number Israel. Because what the temptation is now to say, okay... Uh, you take your census people, they come back with the, with the um, census, and they come back with their sheets of you know, population, how many do we have in the army, and so forth. And then you start to rely on the arm of the flesh. So you have, i just use a figure, you have 5 million Israelis, and you have men that are ready to go 200,000. But the nations that are around you, who are always were at war with Israel, and to this day still are. They, they say, well, what's coming up against us is in the millions. And so now, all of a sudden, you start to say, well, what was the census again? How many uh, men do we have ready to go for battle? 200,000. What's coming up against us? Three, four million? We're going to lose. And that's how you di differentiate between someone who knows God Jonathan, David's friend, Saul's son, mm -hmm. knew that God could save with many or he could save with few. It matters little to God. He could save with one. Elijah uh, slaughtered 850 prophets, false prophets, uh, because the, it's in the hands of God. So David, it says in verse 2, David said to Joab and to the rulers of the people, Go. Number Israel from Beersheba even to Dan and bring the number of them to me that I may know it. And listen to this. And Joab answered, the Lord make his people a hundred times so many more as they be. But my Lord, the king, are they not all my Lord's servants? Why then doth my Lord require this thing? See, Joab knew that this was not supposed to be done. Israel at this point in time is... Pretty much at its peak of spirituality with David, under David's um, monarchy, is, is, is him being king. Why will he be a cause of trespass to Israel? This is a small thing. Talk about a census. I'm just talking about knowing how many people we got in the kingdom. And Joab is strictly warning the king because he knows the rule. God said, don't do this. Because the moment you do, the moment you do, 
You're trusting in the arm of the flesh. How many times have I told you, and I'll remind you again tonight, in all the years, you know, since we've been singing some of these songs when our artists wrote these songs, you know, we're going to take the city and we're taking this back and we're taking that back. And the situation has only gotten worse. And why is that? Because God's not honoring it. And why is that? Because his people, the people are not honoring, people who profess Christ are not honoring him. They're not doing what he said. Here's one for you real quick. How did Jesus say, and all men shall know ye are my disciples? And then we invent things. Well, we're going to go out there and carry a sign. There may be times when we need to carry a sign that makes statements. But that's not what Jesus said. And so we invent things. We have a board meeting and people get together. The elders get together. The church has a meeting. How are they going to know we're out there? And we do all this. But Jesus said that they will know you are my disciples by your love one to another. So who are we going to believe? The board of elders? The board of trustees? The school board? Or Christ? When this fervent love, true love, I mean, I mean genuine love, between the brethren, Chris, Christ is in the midst. People intuitively or even intellectually know this is Christianity. These are Christians. Well, nevertheless, in verse 4, the king's word prevailed against Joab, wherefore Joab departed and went throughout all Israel and came to Jerusalem. And Joab gave the sum of the number of the people unto David, and all they of Israel were a hundred thousand and a hundred thousand men that drew sword. And Judah was four hundred threescore and ten thousand men that drew sword. And so we go through Levi and Benjamin, um, who were, were not counted. And it says, verse 7, and God was displeased. God was displeased with this thing, therefore he smote Israel. This is where we come into an interesting and fascinating um, aspect of human nature, where we judge God. And we say, God is pretty mean. God is very austere, exacting. But let me remind you, there is nothing that God ever requires of us that's good for God. Tithing including, included. There is nothing that God uh, requires of us that does anything to God. God could not be God if we added something to him. That includes praise and worship or prayer. We never add anything to God. We're always taking from God. Our very life, everything belongs to God. So God gives us commands, but what he does and requires, and he has from the beginning and he will to the end, he's, he makes a statement, God makes a statement, and then he waits until we're either going to A, act on it, or not. And if we don't, then the blessing is withheld. In this case... Here is something David was told not to do. And in the moment, as we go back to verse 1, because the subject here is demonology, the study of Satan and his demons, it says Satan stood up. Satan stood up and he provoked David to do what God said not to do. And everybody got in trouble. By the way, it's very... Um, very, well, dangerous. When we do not pray for those that are in leadership. We know that whoever's in leadership is God-ordained. They can be evil. But at least temporarily, um, God has ordained that leadership to correct his people. God used nations. I mean, you know this stuff. Evil nations, wicked nations to judge his people until they learned the lesson, then he judged the nation. Uh, quick, quickly, I, I would have to go through this a little bit more, but today I received something from my friend from, uh, uh, I think it's one of our um, senators, or not our, it doesn't represent us, but down south, who is alerting people that if New York State legalizes marijuana, and you're going to have to go to a store that sells pot. And in order to get it, you're going to have to show your license. 
You're going to have to show them identification. All right? And what they're going to do, this is coming from a, a representative of our state. What they're going to do then is cross-reference that to see if you own guns. And if you're buying marijuana and you're owning guns, this is, again, the, an elected official stating this, your guns are going to be taken away. So what's behind all of this, by the way? Just I'm off on a tangent here, but I just want to say something about this. This uh, legalization of marijuana because I get into conversations with people, and this was part of my, my testimony, and it was also part of my dissertation I did for my PhD. The link between marijuana and psychosis has been well established. That doesn't mean everybody who smokes pot is gonna become psychotic. But the link between marijuana and schizophrenia, the link between marijuana and psychosis has been well documented in many, many studies over the last 30 years, maybe a little bit more, but 30 years or so, and, and even more so. So we're dealing with a lot of things in this evil world, and God tells us to avoid these things. And always remember that we, because something is legal does not mean that it's lawful in the eyes of God, like abortion. Abortion is legal. It's not lawful in the eyes of God. All right, let's come over here to a book that we're pretty familiar with, and then most of us, I think, are living this out one way or the other, the book of Job. See, the first time we see the name Satan is in that verse, 1 Chronicles 21.1. It's the first time we see the name, the English name, Satan, in our English Bibles. But in the book of Job, and here's a man who definitely had problems, didn't he? He had problems. And does anybody want to say that Job was not a man of faith? Anybody who's re in, the, in a reasonable mind. All right, so we don't. So we don't ju judge Job. Job had problems because he lacked faith. You see, because if he had real faith, these things wouldn't have happened. And whatever car Job drove, certainly whether he would have drove something much more spiffy if he had more faith. Sort of like my car. That's what the preachers do, right? Well, we know that Job is a man of faith. And a very particular man of faith, so much so, that when we finally get over to the book of Ezekiel, he's named Job and Daniel uh, are both named that even if they were there, God would still have to judge the nation. Uh, so that would, we're telling you what an imposing, and even more so when we read what we're going to read. So let's look at verse um, 1, chapter 1. There was a man in the, lame, in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was perfect and upright, and one that feared God and eschewed evil. He hated evil. And then he had seven sons and three daughters. And we see uh, his, his let's, let's call it his business. His business is booming. 7,000 sheep, 3,000 uh, 3, camels. That's a lot of camels. 500 yoke of oxen, 500 she-asses. A great household. So that this man was the greatest of all men of the east. This is a very imposing figure. He's totally righteous and he's wealthy. Well, his sons go out and at verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them. Who are these sons of God? Now we could read a lot of commentaries on that. But the Bible is not so specific, but we would assume them to be angelic beings. And what's interesting here in the Old Testament is that Satan is given access to the throne of God. After we read about his being expelled from heaven and taking a third of the angels with him, it shows you how subtle and cunning he is. And uh, he comes before God 
Now the Lord said unto Satan, Whence, which means where, whence comest thou? Where have you been? Then Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. He's not real specific about what he's been doing, but we know, see further in the Bible, be sober, be vigilant, for your adversary, the devil, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour. You know, and I ask you tonight, will you be the next one? A little whisper in the ear, something that you know contradicts God's word, but Satan has convinced you that you can do what nobody else. In fact, when Jonathan Edwards preached his sermon, Sinners in the Hands of, the, of an Angry God, he made a point in that in his sermon somewhere that the, the, the deception of people is that you can do what sent other people to hell. I mean, the same exact thing, but you will get away with it. And that's a deception. Remember this, no matter who you are, starting with Pastor Ray and working its way out, nobody is exempt. God is no respecter of persons. There's nobody on his list that he has to play up to, like our politicians. Nobody pays God off. He's no respecter of persons. Verse 8. So Satan's walking up and down the earth. And the Lord said unto Satan, Hast thou considered my servant Job? That there is none like him in the earth. Not one. That was what was said of Moses when Moses was alive. That he was the humblest, meekest man in, in the earth. That there is none like him in the earth, a perfect and an upright man, one that feareth God and escheweth evil. Now here's the bit of the mystery we see in the spirit realm in the heavenlies, where Satan answered the Lord and said, Doth Job fear God for naught? I mean, is he, is he just that righteous that he knows just to pay you the reverence and respect, obedience that you deserve? Or is it that you've made a hedge about him in verse 10, and about his house. I mean, you got walls built around this guy. Nobody can get through. My demons can't get through. I can't get through. Has thou not made an hedge about him and about his house and about all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his substance is increased in the land. So what Satan is saying here is that sure, sure he obeys you because you've blessed him so much. But as I've just said to you, it's just the reverse. The blessing comes because of obedience. It's not, it's not, we don't obey because God's been, well, I mean, we do obey because God's been good to us. But there's still a whole lot out here in this darkness of this walk of faith where we're walking into places where God said it's going to be okay, but we're not so sure. And that's where we either walk or we don't based on the word of God. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. In this dark world, you need a light and you need a lamp. And I wouldn't be looking to Washington, D.C. for it. Put forth, verse 11, this is Satan. Put forth thine hand now and touch all that he hath, and he will curse thee to thy face. Of course, touching what he has doesn't mean God's going to bless it and increase it. He's going to destroy it and take it away from him. But Satan is the one that does it. Satan is the agent. And the Lord said unto Satan, Behold, all that he hath is in thy power. Only upon himself put not forth thine hand. So Satan went forth from the presence of the Lord. And if you've read the book, which I'm sure that you have, um, things really go downhill after that. He loses his health. His sons all die. His daughters his, his substance that we read about, his flocks, all stolen, taken. There's all types of events that happened to him. And in, at least in my mind, one of the worst of them all, on top of his misery, is his friends. These are his friends. Imagine if his enemies came. His friends come and basically say, you know, you've sinned against God. We know it because look at what's happening in your life. 
Look at your life. It's nothing but hardship and misery and, uh, and death and all of this and destruction. You've sinned against God. All through the book, Job was making an argument. I have not sinned against God. And then his wife comes along. And she just, she really laces into him. You just curse God and die. I mean, you talk about being alone. You talk about being on top of the world and all of a sudden you spiral down. And by the way, David is an example too. We, we, uh, met, we went through this a few weeks back at Ziklag. One day he's the hero. The next day they're all saying, let's kill him. Because he's the one that got us into this. He's got us mixed up with the Philistines. And now our wives are gone. Our children are gone. Kill him. But David encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes there's nobody around to encourage you. Job is an example. His friends are telling him you've sinned and offended God. His wife is saying just, just, just spit and die and curse God and die. Nobody curses God on their deathbed. Uh, maybe some, but that, that's, that's just saying how wicked she thought he was. Oh, no, it was okay when she got all the benefits, right? But of course, she lost her sons and her daughters. And who brought all this on? The man of the house. Who God says is the most righteous man in the whole world. Now, let's just step back for a minute and take a, a moment to look at ourselves. If the most righteous man in the world is going to get tested, and I hope that we are never tested, all any of us like this. I... Um, don't think anybody would like that. But I do want to say that if God tested Job and David and all the rest, is there any reason why he wouldn't test us? And one of the things that has been uh, coming to my attention as I'm meditating in the word is not the, the large <clears throat> commandments, you know, the adultery and the stealing again, and the murder. It's the small ones. It's the little ones that we seem to just kind of gloss over. For instance, in the book of Proverbs, it says that if you cast out a gossip, a slanderer, all the gossip ceases. Now, I've seen this and experienced this in my ministry, and it's a glorious day <clears throat> when you find the troublemaker, finally. And I'll say it's a him. It's not always a him, a, a man. And you find this person and you confront them and you tell them, you're going to stop doing what you're doing. And they say, they, we will not. And then, you know, they, they take a few of their friends with them. And all of a sudden, even though it's initially um, a hurtful thing, there's just peace. And why? Because there's a little verse in the book of Proverbs, a little verse that says, cast them out and the contention shall cease. Now we combine that with another little verse. That it says it's better to eat a little dish of vegetables, right, herbs, than to have the fatted calf with strife. So you have a big, big church, and everybody's in argument, arguing and fighting, and you know you have problems of all over the place. Isn't it better to get rid of all of that? Oh, now you, the pastor's not the big shot anymore. The pastor's not, you know, the uh, what do you call it, the um, big man on campus. But let me tell you something, it's a whole lot better when you've got peace with each other. Mm. Right? Mm. Then this one over here, who don't like that one over there, who don't want to talk to that one over there because he don't get along with that one over there. And then, of course, the pastor, who's never right. Mm. And then the, he's, hey, we got we to we think about this, ba 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 When you come to church, with, you come to a church meeting, I'm still trying to weed this out of my conversation. And we come to church meetings with problems, and then you're handed more problems. I mean, I've seen church meetings where people who are new are being grabbed by elders, and uh, we want to talk to you about the pastor. So the guy came in here with a bunch of problems, and now the elders feeding it with more problems, and everybody's nuts. <laughs> everybody's nuts. <laughs> well, that's satanic. But God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all the churches. 
Now this, you know, to, to make another illustration, what we want is to come to our meetings and have peace with God and peace with each other. But if Satan, who is he, he, I mean, I don't know that he's here tonight. I know Christ is here tonight. But Satan comes and goes. Christ doesn't. Holy Spirit doesn't. No, Satan will come. And when he comes and he's whispering in somebody's ear or whatever, and they bite on that bait, now decisions have to be made on the, what's good for the whole. Is this person going to be allowed to ruin everybody's uh, relationship with the Lord? Or do we just simply say, you know what? You need to, even if it's temporary, step aside. Sometimes, sometimes the church is, is blessed when certain select people leave than when certain select people come in. Mm-hmm. And it can be a blessing either way. So Satan, we're introduced to him in the book of Job. And Satan is saying this, Job only respects you and reverences you because you've treated him so good. Well, things don't go so good, so we go to chapter 2. And in verse 22, in chapter 1, In all this Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. What's the proverb? Again, book of Proverbs, it says that a man perverts his own way, and his heart frets against the Lord. I buried a young boy many years ago who was drinking, 17 years old, drunk, wrapped himself around the tree at an excessive speed. And it was definitely a tragedy. But all the young people were shaking their hands at God. Why did God take his life? Why? And I, you know, me, my reputation is being right to the point. I said, God did not pour alcohol down his throat. It's unfortunate, it's a tragedy. But that was his decision, and it ended up bad. But don't you blame God for your troubles. A, this is an evil world. B, most of the troubles we have, at least in the way I think of things, are based on bad decisions we've made. Choices we made. Huh? <laughs> one of my favorite things to talk about when we, you're with a... A married couple, or one of the couple, one of the one of the two are there. You know, the husband and the wife, and they complained about the other. I said, well, "You, you chose that person. I didn't. You know, this is not. I'm not Reverend Sung Young Moon. I don't. I don't tell you who you're supposed to marry. You uh, made that choice. Now you're fretting on. What are you fretting about? God, you, God. You made the choice. Sometimes we make choices. We don't have all the information. We don't have the principles locked in the head." So, you know, we bump up against ourselves. But the point here is the fact is that no matter what we do, and the more we press in to know the Lord, Satan is adamant that he's going to stop that progress. Even if he he says, um, I know I can't take them out of heaven. I can't steal their salvation. But I'm going to make it miserable for them as they try to go forward. Now, in Ephesians 6, we go back to that, and we're taught by God, through the Holy Spirit, through the Apostle Paul, put on the armor. Get prepared. You're going to have a fight. If, have any of you been in a fight? There's a lot of women here tonight. Have you ever been in a fight, and as soon as you know you're going to be in a fight, your stomach gets in a knot? I'll tell you something that's funny, unusual about me. I don't know why. Anytime I was ever going to get in a fight, I would get very, very calm. I don't know, maybe it was <laughs> Irish demons, psychosis, I don't know. For some reason, I would become very, very calm, which is one of the secrets to fighting and winning. I mean, you can fight, but it doesn't mean it's going to be good. Um, <clears throat> so what we got to get rid of the butterflies in our stomach. When we learn about Satan and we study him here on Wednesdays, we got to start to know that we're in a fight There is no way out of this fight except to surrender, and that is not an option. Surrender is not an option. Losing is not an option. We, you know, you look in Revelation, right? We we went through this some time ago. And to each church, he says, to him that overcomes. It's not a suggestion. It's not like saying, you know, if you overcome, you overcome. If you don't, you don't, you know. Jesus is saying, overcome. Overcome. Just wrote this to someone just uh, a week or so back. 
the Marine Corps' uh, credo, improvise, adapt, overcome. Losing is not an option. Look at the, look at the Spartans at the bottom, Battle of Thermopylae, where we get our, our expression here in America with the Second Amendment and guns. <clears throat> when King Leonidas, they're, they're just you know, hopelessly outnumbered by the Persian army. And 300 Spartans are blocking the pass. And Leonidas comes along. And they know they're going to die. And uh, Leonidas knows they're going to die. And he says, throw down your weapons. Give up your weapons. And what does King Leonidas say? You want them? Come and take them. That's where we get the, in case you've seen it, um, that we use that in, in America. You want to confiscate my gun? Come and get it. There's an implication there is that you're not getting it with a warm hand. You'll have to take it out of a cold hand because you're not taking my gun. Okay, I didn't want to talk about guns. I just want to talk about fights. <laughs> We're in a fight for our nation. Who do you think is, is doing all this here in, in Washington? Let's say, let's start with Washington. Who do you think is behind the states that are putting in infanticide? Abortion is bad enough, which is really infanticide to begin with. But since we don't see the kid, we don't see the child, no big deal. But once you have a baby outside the womb, well, what's next? The old, the weak, the infirm, the mentally ret retarded, anybody who's not good for society, anybody who's not productive, we just start killing them? Well, that's the way it will go. That's the way it's going to go. That's human nature. You justify it on one end, and there's no end to it after that. But who, what I'm saying is, who's behind all of this? Satan. Convincing people who are now deluded that this is right. All right. Quickly, let me talk about socialism and I'll finish. Socialism. There's 10 of us in a room. Somebody each gives us a dollar. It's a guarantee if you come back in six months, one person will have all 10 of those dollars. They'll finagle it out of your hands. I'll hold the money. When we were kids and we, we would go out for a weekend, like Memorial Day down to Seaside Heights, you know, I mean, we were in just post high school, and uh, we would put our money into a, a, a pot, not a very regular pot, but somebody would have, hold the money. I'll never forget, if my best friend's watching tonight, uh, remember this, <laughs> that we're hungry, and they went out to the batting cages and spent all the rest of our money. That was, uh, that was uh, socialism back in the day. Yeah, and we're all getting hungry and they're laughing because they went to the batting cages and had fun. That socialism is a, is, a, is a corrupt ideology that, take, that does not take in the fact that man is sinful. And if we're all here going to share the money, and if there's one person who is covetous or has avarice as their, one of their main faults, well, you're just a thief. It won't be long before you're driving the fancy car and we're all walking or on bicycles... <laughs> well, you got all the food, and we're standing in a bread line for hours, and this is common sense. Look at Venezuela, and on and on and on, and yet we have representatives in Congress right now, at least two, that are saying, this is good for us. <laughs> now, either they're delusional, or they think speaking to us, we're delusional. But I can assure you, most Americans on that issue are not delusional. All right. Let me close by saying that the, the study of Satan is nearly as important as the study of God himself. We know that God, and we know who he is, we've done it here so many times, you know, go through the attributes of God, but we, we've got to know who Satan is. We've got to know his tactics, his wiles, which means stratagem, his Greek word stratagem. Um, we've got to know his strategy. What is his strategy for time for truth? I can't say I know specifically, but I do know one thing. You've been trying to wear me down with discouragement and sickness and this, that, and the other thing. Anything you can. Anything with me. I'm just talking about me because I don't know if you would know this, but I'm the pastor. <laughs> <coughs> and um, I mean, just in case you're not sh Let's not talk about that. Um, smite the shepherd. 
and the sheep shall be scattered. Mm -hmm. You'll be thrown into confusion because you know, somebody asked me that too. What's the backup plan? I shook my head. <laughs> Ain't no backup plan. We're out on the line like the Willenda brothers and family and uh, if the wind blows too strong, pew, you know. Well, then you keep on praying because believe me, the enemy has been relentless. Relentless, bing, bang, boom, boom. Um, but I do believe God. I do believe God. Okay, so as we study demonology is the, is the overarching head. Right now we're just looking at Satan, just the name Satan and where he appears. And then we're going to go further. Then we're going to start to see what demons do. And how they affect the mind and create anxiety and create fears and... All of it is contradicting God. At the bottom of it, just remember one thing about Satan. Jesus said he's not only a liar, but he's the father. He's the original liar. Has God said, you're not going to die. Father, help us to understand our enemy and the tactics that he uses against us. He uses it in our families, our marriage, our health, our mental health. He uses it when we study the Bible. He uses it when we turn into false teachers and false prophets on the television and what they sound, say rather, sounds really good. Unfortunately, it's not true. Help us, God, to be able to discern your spirit versus evil spirits, Satan. God, you taught us, uh, Jesus, you taught us in the uh, Our Father that we are to pray, deliver us from evil. And some commentators have said that that means the evil one. And I think that that's good. I mean, a good tr translation, a good interpretation. Deliver us, deliver time for truth from the evil one. Yes. Deliver the pastor and his wife and family. Yes. Deliver all of my friends that are here. Deliver yes. us from the evil one. Yes. And lead us not into temptation. Yes, Lord. God, we bless you. We praise you. We thank you. For who you are, for what you've done and what you've given to us, we bless you. Give everyone here tonight, Father, please, a safe traveling mercy. Give them a great night's sleep when they go home. And we will know that in the morning, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.